Welcome, everybody. I'm Sven Hosford, and this is the podcast of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. It's Tuesday, July 15th, and we come to you every Tuesday to talk about integrative medicine in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, we want to remind you that the print issue of our magazine is out on the street, and you can find that at many places around town. And if you just visit our website, journaloflifestylemedicine.com, you can check out the map and see where all we have put it out there. Join us again uh, every Tuesday at 4 o'clock right here. We're live when we talk to our special guests around 4 o'clock. And uh, you can catch the pre-recorded podcasts every week on Facebook, Google+, iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, and Stitcher. So this is going to be a really interesting podcast. We've got two really, really interesting ladies. One is going to talk about acupuncture. As we all know that acupuncture has become very widely accepted. It's even used by medical doctors, and yet many people still find it pretty mysterious. And we'll do our best to demystify that with Debbie Harden. She wrote an article for us in this new issue of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. And we'll talk about that and many other things, including a clinic that she has coming up on Friday. And then a little bit later in this podcast, we will talk to Dr. Betsy O'Neill of the Allegheny Health Network. Uh, you may have seen her at the conference uh, or maybe saw the video of her at the conference. And uh, we will sit down with her as uh, she was just recently out at St. Clair for the Psychiatric Grand Rounds. And I've got the tape to prove it. So we'll watch that entire uh, you can watch the entire St. Clair podcast. It's very interesting talk about the roles and responsibilities of integrative medicine professionals. And you can see that at the St. Clair YouTube channel. And St. Clair is S-E-C-L-A-I-R-E-R.com. So first, let's take a look at the calendar for the week, uh, what's coming up. As I said, we've got an acupuncture happy hour coming up, uh, a clinic, a happy hour clinic at the Nguyen Center. Uh, Debbie Harden is going to be doing that on Friday afternoon. Great way to wind down your week with a, uh, a popsicle made from tea from the urban, uh, the Hillcrest Urban Farms and some acupuncture. I think that's a really interesting way to end the week. July 26th, next Saturday is the World Magazine Yoga Fest. And uh, you can find out more about the World Fest, <laughs> Yoga Fest at World Magazine. That's W H I R L magazine.com slash Yoga Fest. Uh, and then on August 3rd, um, this is something coming up uh, with Organically Social. Uh, we've been uh, creating some real interesting plans here with uh, Trenton and all the folks over at Organically Social. It's got a great network of health and wellness businesses. So on August 3rd, we're going to start something called Social Joe Hour, 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. And we're going to get together and talk about social media. And this is especially for business owners and professionals. Then coming up on August 6th, if you are interested in more Connections with an Integrative Medicine Doctor. That's Dr. Uma Perugala. I can't ever get her name right. Perugala. And uh, she's going to be out at St. Clair talking about quantum healing, uh, unconditionally well, a quantum leap. She's a really, really interesting doctor, and uh, she's out there fighting the good fight. So if you want to support her, show up at St. Clair on August 6th. That's a Wednesday at 9 o'clock. You can also watch that one on the podcast live or catch it on their YouTube channel later on. And then another date you want to put on your calendar is August 16th, and that is going to be the Organically Social Wellness Expo from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. out at the Pittsburgh Public Market. Uh, it's a great opportunity to mix and mingle with a whole bunch of organically social peeps, and we will also be inviting our meetup group out there. So if you are a member of our meetup group, that's the Integrative Medicine Professionals on meetup.com, then you want to... Uh, Watch the announcement for that. I'll be putting that up there within the next few days. Another social Joe on September 7th. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a future calendar. Uh, November, mark your calendars if you're a massage therapist. You want to get all your CEs for the next two-year cycle. You can go on out to Seven Springs and spend the weekend with the Pittsburgh School of Massage Therapy and Dean Juhan. Uh, talking about the shoulder girdle, the pelvic girdle, and, and the spine and torso. Get all your CEs for the two-year period. 
And then also in November, if you're interested in taking a trip to Ecuador with three, yes, count them, three integrative medicine professionals, that'd be Dr. Dan Wagner uh, and Dr. Safdar Chaudhry and Ola Obasi, then uh, be sure to catch the video of Dan's description of the trip and uh, his um, itinerary. It's all up online. So that is the calendar for the week. And we are now talking with Debbie Harden. She's got an MAC and an LAC. And I'm, I guess the first question I need to ask is what those mean. And she's an acupuncturist over at the Newen Center in Highland Park. And this Friday, she's going to be hosting an acupuncture happy hour. So welcome, Debbie. Thank you. Good to be here. Tell us about, uh, first, I guess, like I say, I have to ask what the MAC and the LAC stand for. Sure. Yeah, so MAC is Master of Acupuncture. So that means I went on to get about three and a half years to four years of training in acupuncture and Chinese medicine. Wow. And then the LAC means that I'm licensed by the state of Pennsylvania. Okay. Okay. So that is something that is licensed by the state. Yeah. Each state varies in their requirements. Pennsylvania requires the national board exams. So... I also have a couple other letters that represent that. So oh, so you got even more initials you could put after your name. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Just for fun. <laughs> so tell us about what the, your acupuncture happy hour is like uh, coming up on Friday. Yeah, so I've done a whole bunch of these in the past. They've been really popular. I was doing them at Embody Natural Health in Lawrenceville, but that location is closed, mm -hmm. and they're just keeping the Wexford one. So this one will be at the Newman Center, which is where I have my private practice. And we'll use one of the community rooms. They're just a really wonderful opportunity for people to try acupuncture if they've never had it. It's a simple treatment that's done with people sitting in their chairs. The needles just go in the ear so you don't have to get undressed. You don't have to tell your whole life story. Okay. So it's Most just of the in the time, ear. people are going to have an immediate relaxation response with okay. this particular treatment. It's really powerful. Very, very relaxing. It's good for run-of-the-mill stress, anxiety, insomnia those kinds of things. So it is a, it is a treatment for specifically for those things. Yeah. When you do it mm -hmm. in a year. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. This is a great way to de-stress at the end of the week. For sure. Yeah. And it'll start out with people. People can just come, they can ask questions. They can bring a friend if they want, just mingle a little bit. And this time this will be something new. We're going to have tea pops from Hillcrest Urban Farm, which if you haven't had one of those, they are so delicious. That's what I was going to ask. That sounds like really refreshing on a, on a summer afternoon. Yeah. yeah. So Hillcrest is a farm in Garfield and they right. grow a lot of their own medicinal herbs and they make these tea pops out of various fruit juices and some er herbs and all kinds of really cool flavors. So that'll be a nice twist this time around. That's really neat. So $25.00. And mm -hmm. so, like you said, it's a great way for people to try out acupuncture if they've never had it or just somebody wants a little bit of a, a relaxation with some ear work. Exactly. Yeah. And I'll do some guided meditation once the needles are in as well. And people seem to really enjoy it. Okay. Well, that sounds really exciting. I, I know in other cities, there are a lot of places that have um, acupuncture clinics and they'll work like from the elbow down or from the knee down. Uh, in a kind of a, a big room, and it's an opera, It's a way for, I guess this is more the way it's done in China, isn't that right? In some ways, yeah. I mean, there's a huge range of the way, of ways it's done in China, but that is one of them, yeah. And I'd say that's something that's missing in Pittsburgh at this point. There was someone doing a community clinic in Lawrenceville, right. um, but he's since left. Okay. So there's there's room for that, there's and for I'm that. not going to be able to fill that hole because my practice is primarily based on one on one. I spend a lot of individual time, and I get to points on the whole body. Um, so these clinics that I do periodically are just a way for me to help reach out a little bit more. But I think there's space for someone doing that full time in Pittsburgh. It'd be nice to see. Can you talk a little bit about why in China that this is considered like a frontline uh, modality? It's just been part of their history from from the very beginning. I mean, they they can see exactly how effective it's been just over time. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's something where it's, I'd say it's very integrated into medical care. Any hospital there is going to have a whole range of modalities available. If someone needs surgery, of course, there's going to be a surgeon available. But these other things are tried first because it just makes sense to do something that's less invasive at the start to really try to bring about wellness, well-being, health, and then go on to the more extreme measures as needed. 
let's talk about, um, I, I love your, your story. So let's talk about how you got into acupuncture. You didn't exactly start out in the medical profession, did you? No, I was actually studying English as an undergrad. And at the time was just kind of getting by. I mean, I got good grades. I did, life was going okay, but I had a lot of nagging health issues, in particular, shoulder pain kind of going up the side of my head, leading to a lot of migraines. Um, I was anxious all the time, especially in social situations, mildly depressed. I got sick a lot. So I had no idea that acupuncture could help with any of these things. I just kind of tried it out of curiosity and was blown away by how different I felt. It it was a life changing experience for me. But you actually went in for the shoulder pain and then discovered. Yeah, that was my ticket, yeah. so to speak. And then was kind of blown away by how different I felt in so many other ways. Well, let's talk about that. I li- Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I really love about this medicine is that people come to it for so many different reasons. I mean, some people, they, they already know that acupuncture is capable of helping them in all kinds of ways. But some people, they just think of it, oh, well, I have back pain, so I've heard acupuncture is helpful. Maybe I'll give this kind of strange thing a try. And then when they, they just become more aware of their body, they start to see changes in other parts of their life. And it, it's pretty amazing to see that. It's one of the most fulfilling parts of my job, I would say, to see people surprised by how good they can actually feel when they've sort of resigned themselves to just feeling a certain way. Because we all, I mean, the, the standard uh, common knowledge is, like you say, that we know acupuncture is good for pain. But like you say, depression, anxiety, um, how does that happen? Well, everything, there, there really is no separation, no, no hard separation between the mind and the body. So oh. if, if, un- if there is an imbalance somewhere, it's going to show up as either, either emotional pain or physical pain or both. And acupuncture can treat both of those things. It's treating patterns in the body. It doesn't necessarily matter how they're manifesting, whether it's a physical symptom or an emotional symptom. Yeah. Well, that's actually what you wrote about in your article in the summer issue of our magazine. Um, And I I really like to spend a little bit of time talking about this is that um, the whole idea of balance and imbalance and how acupuncture addresses that. Uh, and how right. that's actually like the core of so many different things. Um, for somebody who doesn't know what we're talking about, balance of what? What's balance? What's imbalanced? If I stand on one foot and I'm waving around, that's imbalanced or, or not. Tell me what's imbalanced. Yeah. So I guess another word that I would use to describe it would be resiliency. So to me, resiliency or balance means that we can handle whatever's coming at us in life. It doesn't mean that we never have symptoms or that we never get sick or that things are never off. It means that we have enough of a connection to the part of us that can handle it and the part of us that can heal from it and the part of us that can move beyond it or kind of contain it, that it doesn't knock us down in the same way. I think that's- uh, Because we're never gonna be symptom free. I mean, we're always gonna have those things. And when we, can, when we can see that the symptoms are teaching us something, when we can see them as an opportunity to learn a little bit more about our bodies, learn a little bit more about what it, will take to live a good life, then we don't have to be as afraid of them. We can just see them as a a step, Mm -hmm. a path. Well, I liked, um, I like what you say about there's no real hard separation between uh, mind and body. And and in in preparing um, for this talk, you you gave me a phrase, which I really like, and that was that um, this is a holistic and ecological versus a reductionist and mechanical kind of a process. Can you talk a little bit about that, how how acupuncture or, or Chinese medicine views the body as one indivisible whole? Right, yeah, because both of those viewpoints are important. It just depends on which one is the most important at the time, given what's going on. So Chinese medicine, within Chinese medicine, everything matters. So five people could come in with back pain and they're all going to get a different treatment because I'm going to ask them a million other questions about things that might not seem related to their back pain, but give me the completest picture of what this person's whole life is like and where treatment is needed to to bring the whole thing, a whole person into a greater state of wellness, a greater state of balance. So you would ask it's, questions um, about nutrition, you would ask about family life, you ask about stress at work, definitely. those sorts of things? Yeah, yeah, how they sleep, how their digestion is, um, 
trying to get a sense of who they are as a person, how they relate to their life, um, what their passions are, where they feel stuck, where they feel um, excitement about life. Because a lot of times treatment is more about bringing more energy to what's working well, really helping just cultivate that, fan that flame, if you uh, will. And then the part that's working well can handle the parts that aren't necessarily doing so hot. That's actually an interesting point. I don't think, uh, I can't think of any Western medicine modality which says let's build on the strengths. It always seems like let's, here's a problem, let's fix it. Let's get under the hood and right. fix it. You know? Right. And sometimes we need to do that. So it's, but it's good to have that put in its place and yeah. used when it's necessary. And for the most part, really try to activate healing. So for, for somebody who's never had a treatment, um, you've talked about, you ask a million questions and you say in a private session, you spend more time one-on-one -on -one and basically pins might show up anywhere in the body, but talk a little bit about, a little bit more about the actual process. You're putting pins in the body. How long do they stay in? Uh, you know, everyone always asks, does it hurt? That sort of thing. Right. Yeah. So the first visit, that's when I'll spend a lot of time, um, even more time than, than usual talking, getting the whole health history. And then I'll listen to the pulse for a good while. That's another way that I can diagnose what's going on internally and figure out where to best place the needles. Um, and then, yeah, the needles will go in. They'll stay in anywhere from about 20 to 30 minutes. Usually people find it deeply relaxing. Some people even fall asleep, believe it or not. If, if you have a fear of needles, people can actually fall asleep. And they don't hurt. I mean, for the most part, there may be a tiny sensation. Sometimes there will be a little ache or a tug or a tingling, but it's not, it's not pain. Yeah. And, and this is the part where I get really fascinated. Um, I, I mean, I've had acupuncture a number of times. And as you say, it... Oftentimes the needles go in, you don't even notice it. Sometimes there's a little pinch, but every once in a while you get that jolt, and it's like it's like you, you stuck your finger in a socket someplace. Just a little twinge sometimes, sometimes more. What exactly is the pin doing? It's not touching nerves so much. It's actually hitting no. the chi channels, right? The nadis, the nadis. How right. do you pronounce that? Well, we wouldn't call them nadis and. Chinese medicine, but it's a similar okay, idea. Okay, that, that's right. Yeah. That's Indian, right? Okay. Right. So meridians of chi, which, to be honest, from a biomedical perspective, the, there are so many studies going on right now about what they want to know exactly what is going on in it from a from that perspective, and that's still under research. There's some interesting uh, research going on around connective tissue and what happens with the acupuncture needle when it touches the connective tissue. They can see that when they when the needle is placed and then turn, the connective tissue starts to wrap around the needle and then send messages throughout the body, which I, I think this is pretty fascinating. Yeah, because, that is really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, when you hear connective tissue, you just think tendons and ligaments, but it's actually a continuous web that penetrates into every single cell in the body and communicates with the nucleus of every single cell. It wraps every single organ. So it's, it's a continuous network and the ways that they describe connective tissue are really similar to the ways that chi is described. Hmm. I don't think that's the whole answer. I don't think it's going to be as easy as that. Like chi equals connective tissue. I think there may always be something mysterious that's going on that we don't exactly have the tools to measure. Mm -hmm. But I think it's pretty fascinating. Well, they, I have talked to some scientists who say that we do have uh, instruments that can now measure chi. Um, of course, the only problem with that is that the only way you can prove that that's real is with somebody who can feel chi or another instrument. And, you know, so right. to the skeptics, it's, it doesn't really prove anything. But yeah. they have seen with these instruments, they have actually seen the acupressure points, even though they know in, in physiology, there's no actual nerves there. So that's, a, I think, an interesting point I want to emphasize is that the energy meridians are not the nerve lines. No, they aren't. Two, Most people think things. they are. I think a lot of people just labor. Yeah, they think we're touching into the nerves, but we're well, definitely not. Yeah. I think a lot of I think yeah. a lot of medical uh, Western medicine people and a lot of scientists believe that as well. Is that your experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say yeah, yeah. And the nerves are involved. You know, we're activating a certain spot, and it's gonna it's gonna have a connection with everything that's going on in that area, whether it's blood vessels, nerves connective tissue, muscles, everything's going to be affected by that manipulation of the needle. Yeah. 
it, this is really fascinating. I want to just touch on the, the connective tissue again. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, it was actually, uh, I think we're going to have a guest in the, in the near future uh, that's going to talk a lot about this. Um, we have a local expert, uh, David Lasondak, who has been to many of the latest fascia conferences. And oh, nice. some of the uh, some of the signs coming out about that is really interesting. So I want to make sure I ask him about this point. So as you say, you put the needle in and you give a little twist. Do you always twist the needle when you put it in, or is that just sometimes for certain? Almost times? always. Almost yeah, always. I mean, there are some situations where it wouldn't, but almost always. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, from what I know, the connective tissue, it, it, as you say, it permeates the entire body. In fact, no cell of the body is more than two cells away from connective tissue as I understand it. So it literally is mm-hmm. like it, the, the modern science is that that is literally the mind in the body, like that intelligence and it comes literally I can see from that the, for sure. the, the yeah, web of fascia. That's a fitting description. And that they've actually identified um, the chemical that is released by fascia cells that they believe is the source of that uh, communication. So they think they've identified how it communicates. So that's really fascinating that the fascia starts to wrap itself around an acupuncture needle. And, and you know how thin those are. <laughs> those are really, yeah. really thin. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, I don't know where to go with that after, just by talking about that. Um, the whole, the whole really concept, cool. I think, of, fa- <laughs> uh, of connective tissue is something that um, m- most doctors haven't got a clue from what I've seen. And it's something that really... Um, I hope we can talk about more about what this does and how that works in yeah. the future. Because it really, the, the term is fitting, connective. We're so used to thinking of the body, or at least in Western, Western medicine is so used to thinking of the body as these discrete systems, which it's useful to do at times to think of the respiratory system and the cardiovascular system. But they're all in the same body. They're all yeah. connected. And we need to think of them as a whole system as well and not just, oh, well, this is a respiratory problem. This is a cardiovascular problem. And as you see, you're getting to the core issues. Do you, you really do think that you're getting, you're fixing the core problems much of the time, most of the time? I would say, yeah. I mean, that's always the goal. And when you can treat a person and see them improve across a vast array of things that maybe strange symptoms that they can't seem to connect and you can see them all start to resolve with a few treatments that are Hmm. based on their constitution, it's, it's pretty cool to see. That's great. I, I uh, wish you the best of luck. I, I really, uh, I love acupuncture and I get it. How have you, over the last couple of years, have you seen the, the level of acceptance uh, among the public and um, among professionals? Is it getting better? Definitely. Yeah. And I'm in an inter- interesting situation because I came to Pittsburgh about two and a half years ago. I was in private practice in Maryland for three and a half years before that. Mm-hmm. where because of the school, there was a lot of knowledge about acupuncture. Okay. But moving here, these two and a half years, it feels like it's been this huge upswing. Just, I mean, my practice has gotten really busy and there's all kinds of people that are calling and that maybe wouldn't have thought of acupuncture a few months ago, but because they've seen it so much in the public sphere, they're just starting to think about it more and get past some of their reservations. That's great. I've seen a, a number of new acupuncturists yeah. in, in the Pittsburgh area, it seems to me. Mm-hmm. And lo- I love the fact, too, yeah, that and you... Yeah, Pittsburgh has room for many more. Well, obviously, I think the, just the, the evidence of that is that you stepped in to fill the void when somebody else stepped out for a sabbatical. Right. Now, now he's back, and you're both full all the time. Yeah. <laughs> It's great. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. <laughs> it's really wonderful. I think yeah. that says that says no. a lot about the how accepted it is generally today. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you being with us today. Is there anything about acupuncture that you think we haven't talked about that's really important to say? Hmm. I don't put you on no, the I spot. I think we've here. covered a lot. Yeah. I think. I try to I try yes. to cover as much as I can. Um, it's a yeah. it's a fascinating subject. I mean, we could go uh, really in detail for a long ways. I know I didn't want to get too much into the details. For example, I love how Chinese medicine brings in the elements, uh, and then you work with the wood in your body, and then the metal in your body, and the water and the fire in your body. I, I think it's just a fascinating way. And right, 
and it's a really elegant system because you can see it reflected in the way we move through the seasons. So people can, it's a very tangible way to understand, oh, well, winter, there's nothing growing on the surface. Everything is incubating underground. It's building up all this potential. And we're doing that too, if we give ourselves the chance to rest and to recuperate and to contemplate. And then there's this huge upburst in the spring that the plants are going through and all these new ideas and all this new energy. And we can see that in ourselves as well. We, we can really occupy all of those elements and, and really engage with all of them if we're in good health. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it's not just that the mind and the body are one indivisible unit, but there's also doesn't seem to be much division between the person and their environment. They right. interact so well. Or they, they're so important to the interaction there too as well. Yeah. And that's also really clear to see with the weather when it's humid out. If someone has a tendency to be a little bit damp internally, maybe they have kind of a, an achiness in their knees that gets worse with humidity. Then for them, especially eating foods that are going to make that dampness worse, things like dairy or lots of sugar, that would be important to, to point out that connection to see that if things get worse when it's damp out, to not eat damp foods. And that goes for a lot of the other climatic um, elements. You know, that, 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 that could be a whole conversation right there of why sugar and dairy are considered damp foods. I, I, I love that concept, but yeah. I think we'll, <laughs> we'll leave that for the next time. Uh, Debbie Harden <laughs> at the Newen Center. Got a, a happy hour acupuncture clinic coming up Friday. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was wonderful. <laughs> okay, great. And next we're going to talk to Betsy O'Neill. We're going to find out what she has to say. And the question, of course, is why do you, why do you care? Why should you care? And the reason is she has been one of the strongest voices for integrative medicine in our area for a very long time. She was a medical director at the Integrative Medicine Center at Allegheny General Hospital. She is now working uh, at within the entire network of hospitals since I Mark took over. Uh, and you're going to see some very exciting developments in integrative medicine coming up in the near future. So let's take a listen to what Betsy has to say. Just back from the second annual Lifestyle Medicine Conference in Massachusetts, Dr. Betsy O'Neill was the recent guest at the St. Clair Psychiatric Grand Rounds. This is a podcast that is available on the St. Clair YouTube channel, and it's well worth watching for integrative medicine professionals. The topic was how hospitals and smaller clinics can work together, but she also made quite good points about the role and responsibility of integrative medicine professionals, such as learning how to handle your own stress, learning how damaging stress is to begin with, how to be a better example of proper health habits by leading the way of lifestyle, and also the importance of medical professionals to support and take care of each other. Care for the caregivers was a very important topic. So I spoke with her afterwards about just how caregivers can learn to de-stress. Well, the first step really is just to recognize the importance of it, which I think a lot of people don't spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, and the other thing is just to realize that to have effective stress management doesn't necessarily mean that you have to spend an hour meditating every day. That if you could even just take five minutes once or twice a day to do something to relax your mind, that that could make a difference in the way you feel overall. Um, so I guess recognizing the importance of it and realizing that it doesn't have to involve a lot of time. And then just the next step would be educating yourself about different ways to do it. And what, what about support and support groups and people to turn to? What's the best place you found for that kind of support? Um, I think for me, I'm lucky in that that's mostly my working colleagues. You know, we do it for each other. When we teach other people stress management, we're getting the benefits of it ourselves if we go through an exercise. So for me, it's easy, but most clinicians are not going to have that kind of a work environment where they're going to be getting that kind of support from their colleagues. And if you talk about like a support group, that's just going to be another thing that people have to do that's going to take up time in their day. So that's probably not going to be really effective for people. I think the thing to do is just seek out those friends, colleagues, family members 
who do have an interest, who may have some knowledge about it, and just cultivate those relationships so that you feel like you have someone to share ideas with. You know, I tried this, it didn't really work. I tried this other thing, it seemed to work. What works for you? You know. Mm -hmm. So creating community and finding other practitioners that are interested in that sort of thing. Right. So, and I appreciate that you've joined our Integrative Medicine Professionals Meetup group for right. that reason. Right. And you also mentioned that you just got back from Harvard and a conference there on integrative medicine. It was and, on lifestyle medicine. On lifestyle medicine. Oh, excellent. So tell us what's changed from last year, how, you know, what's shifted, how much more accepted is it out there in the, in the big bad world? Um, I think that this was the second conference that they've had. Harvard now has an Institute for Lifestyle Medicine and this year was the second lifestyle medicine conference that they had for providers <clears throat> and um, one of the sessions was inviting people who had been at the one last year to come back and talk about successes that they'd had. So <clears throat> what the organizer of the conference um, shared with us at the outset and again at the end of the conference was that it's already apparent in just one year that many more people are interested, there's a lot more energy around the concept of lifestyle medicine, um, that he's getting a lot more, you know, um, sort of inquiries and, and contacts from people who are making this a part of what they do. And there were people who came back from the previous year and indicated, first of all, what lifestyle behavior changes they've made in their own lives and then secondly how they were building programs in their hospitals and clinics. I was amazed to see that, I mean I know Harvard is a really well respected institution but there were people there from all over the world. There were two doctors there from Nigeria which is a place where I wouldn't really think people had problems with bad diet and you know not enough exercise. <laughs> not enough exercise. But actually I learned that it's becoming a problem even in the developing world. Well, I think anywhere there's a middle class I think you have It's this unbelievable yeah. and um, so there were people there from all over the world um, but you know obviously most of them from the United States and it was just really gratifying to see you know primary care providers who were there and, and we all shared who we were, where we were from, and why we were there, and a lot of people were there saying, I know that I need to be doing this with my patients, and I know that I need to be a better example myself, so I need to learn some of this for myself, too. So I think that's a real shift in medicine that people are realizing that, as physicians, they have to be examples for their patients, mm -hmm. not just in not smoking, but, you know, in having a realistic weight and you know being involved in regular exercise and promoting healthy food and doing stress management does there seem to be more acceptance within the medical community of the term lifestyle medicine over integrative medicine I think lifestyle medicine is easier for people to understand because it just is what it is where integrative medicine you have to explain to people it doesn't tell you right off exactly what you're integrating yeah. right so um, I think lifestyle medicine is easier for people to understand and I also think that it's becoming more a part of the awareness of the medical community that lifestyle is a big factor in illness mm -hmm. and that we have to find effective ways to deal with it. Yeah. There are uh, uh, organizations like the Institute of Integral Nutrition which are putting out hundreds of new health coaches every year. Is there any plan uh, you know, either formally or informally for Allegheny or any other doctors you know of to start seeking those cl those coaches out to start to work with them? Our model is to incorporate coaching in what we do with people because it's really the only effective way to, to get people to change their behaviors. And so the, the problem right now is that there's not a reimbursement model for it, so we have to figure out how to make it work financially. But I think our program is going to be based on a coaching model and hopefully that will be a model that if it's successful and we believe that it will be that then other clinics and other practices will want to emulate. Of course that will all be easier if it becomes you know, financially feasible for us to do that kind of work. Sure. Now uh, there may be some new uh, opportunities for jobs at uh, Allegheny for integrative medicine professionals. Are you anything you can tell us about that? Um, what will certainly happen, um, you know, within the next one to two years, is that we will want to have independent contracting providers who can provide services because we. 
we can't just hire a bunch of people, but we're going to need people who can provide services. And so we would bring people on as independent contractors to provide things like acupuncture, massage therapy, um, you know, psychology services, and, and potentially many other therapies too. Great. Well, we'll uh, hopefully have you on when you can tell us more about all those exciting developments. That'd be great. All right. Thanks very much, Betsy. Oh, you're welcome. So that's it for this week. Join us again here every week, uh, Tuesday at 4 o'clock, if you want to watch us live or on iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, and Stitcher. And be sure to like us and follow us on our Facebook page. We'll have lots of pictures of what's going on and updates and connections with lots of people in the community. And also, if you are a wellness or medical professional of any kind, please be sure to join our meetup group, Integrative Medicine Professionals. And we're all over Western Pennsylvania, over 125 people now, uh, all medical professionals, all of us interested in changing the way we do medicine to make it more whole, more natural, and more sane. So until next week, yins be careful out there.